This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. You're listening to Qalam Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Qalam is pleased to announce the Khatib Training Workshop. Find out more at khatibworkshop.com. That's K H A. T E E B workshop dot com. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a siratu nabawiya. In last the previous session, last week's session, we left off kind of a little bit in the middle uh, of the story of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. Um, And so it's a very, very powerful story. So to be able to kind of benefit from the very powerful tone of the story, I'm going to kind of reload. I'm going to kind of start back over from the beginning of the story, but not in too much detail. Basically what we talked about was Salman al-Farisi. And the reason why he's called al-Farisi is because he was originally from al-Faris. He was a Persian, uh, ethnically speaking, by origin he was Persian. He talks about how he, his father was the leader of his tribe. His father was the leader of his people. And um, he was an only child, and he said, I was raised, um, in his own words, how you would raise like a young daughter. Meaning my father was extremely overprotective of me. He wouldn't let me go out, he wouldn't let me do much of anything. So he goes, because of that, I was stuck at home a lot of times, and I pretty much just used to engage in the worship that we engaged in, the fire worshiping, that was a part of their life and their culture. He goes, that's pretty much what I did. It was my responsibility to keep the fire lit, to keep it kindled, and that's all I knew, that was my whole life, that was my whole world and that's what I did. He said until finally one day my father sent me on an errand, a business errand. When I went on this errand and he was very particular and cautious, he was very nervous at sending me because he didn't want to let me out. And he goes, no sooner did I leave and on the way I found a, a Christian, you know like a church basically, a Christian monastery. And they were engaging in worship there. And when I came across it, I was so amazed, I was so baffled by what I found there. And I was so overwhelmed by that experience. He said, I went in and actually hung out there and took part in the prayer service all the way till the evening. Uh, at which point in time, you know, I finally finished up the errand and I came home and my father was very worried. Where were you? What was going on? I've been running around all day looking for you. You know, why'd you do this? And he says that, I told my father that I found some people and they were worshiping different than we do. And it was amazing, it's so much better than what we do and this and this and this, he goes on and on about it. And his, his father was very disapproving, his father was very disappointed. He said, absolutely no, that's all, that's terrible. What we do is a lot better, I, want, I forbid you from engaging in this, listening to this. I don't want you to have anything to do with this stuff anymore. But he said it was very obvious to my, to my father that I had caught the bug. I was, I, I was sold. And so he actually says that my father actually tied me up in the home. He restrained me, put a chain around my foot so that I wouldn't go out and I wouldn't go to this church anymore and you know, mess with any of this business. He just wanted things to go back to the way they were before. So he says that I sent a message there to those people at that church or that monastery. I sent a message to them saying that you know, um, or, or rather he actually, when he was there worshiping with them, he had asked them, where did you learn how to do this? Because they were Persian folks as well. They said that we learned this from the people of Asham. So he sent a message to them saying, whenever people from Asham come next time, let me know, send me a message. They said, okay, that's fine. When there was a business trading caravan that arrived from Asham, when they arrived there in Asfahan, near Asfahan, outside in a small little town called Hay, that's where Salman al-Farsi was from. They sent a message to him that some people from Asham have come and you wanted to know. He's like, let me know when they're returning back home, when they're gonna be going back home, let me know. So they send him a message that the people are departing the next day. Salman radiallahu anhu all along had figured out a way to be able to free himself from the shackle and be able to escape. And he was just biding his time. He was waiting for the opportunity. He escaped from home, ran away, went with these people to Asham. And there he talks about his experiences. He found a Christian priest over there. He wanted to study with him and live with him and benefit from him and learn from him. 
But he says he turned out to be a very terrible human being. He was basically collecting donations, but he was stealing people's money and hoarding the wealth for himself. And he said, eventually I exposed him. I told the people that he's been stealing your money, and I showed them where he was buried, and they ended up, he said they basically killed him, they crucified him, they, they executed him because of what he had done. He said the man who then took over the position there uh, at that monastery was one of the most amazing human beings I had ever met. He was a remarkable person, very pious and righteous on the true teachings of Isa alayhi salam. So he said, I lived with him for many years and I benefited from him. Until the point where he was about to die. Then I said, okay, who should I go to? Because I don't want to go to just anybody. I've experienced what bad people are like. I want to go to somebody that's like you. Recommend, rec- who would you recommend that I go and I study with now? So he sent me to someone. I went there, stayed with him until he was alive. And he said, most of these gentlemen were very old. They were elderly priests and monks. So he says, when he was about to die, I told him, okay, who do you recommend me to? He sent me to a third guy, then I went to a fourth guy, and he said, this way I kind of bounced around to about three or four different, very, very good, amazing people who were still practicing the true deen of Isa alayhi salam. They were like the hunafa of their times. We've talked about this before. He said, finally, until the very last guy that I was with at a place called Ammuriya, I asked him, who should I go to now? He goes, there's nobody else you should go to now. Rather, you should go to such and such place. And he described the place in Arabia, in the desert. He said, the people there are pagans. They're idol worshippers. There are some Jewish people. And he described the place. And he said, go to a place that is very... um, It's it's very abundant in dates. It's very good for date farming. For farming and growing dates. And he described some features of the area and the region. He said, go there and wait there because the prophet of the last time, his time has come very near and very close. And that place that I'm describing to you is the place where he will migrate to. He adaru hijratihi. That is the place that he will migrate to. So go there and wait for him. So Salman radiallahu anhu says that, I decided to travel to this place in Arabia and I took up with some business people who had come from Arabia. But then they did me wrong. They basically tied me up and sold me in the marketplace as a slave, wrongfully. They oppressed me. So he said, I became a slave. But what could I do? There was no other option. There was no recourse. And he said, I lived a life of slavery. And then eventually my owner sold me to one of his acquaintances who was from a city, a town called Yathrib. And when I was sold to him and I went there to his, and he owned a garden where he grew date palms, when I got there and I looked around, I knew that I was in the right place. So even though I was in slavery, I was content with being there. Because I knew that this is where I need to be. He said, a few years passed like this, and finally one day I'm up in the trees, working and cleaning and cutting and trimming the trees. And my owner, the master, his cousin, he comes and says that, you know, we're ruined, we're done. They were basically Jews from the tribe of Banu Quraida. He said, we're done for. He said, why? He goes, all these pagans, all these jahils, all these Arabs, they're all gathering outside of Medina at a place called Quba because a man has come there who claims to be a prophet and they've all gone there to join up forces with him. So because originally the Jews of Medina had capitalized on the fact that the Arabs of Yathrib did not get along with each other. Aus and Khazraj had been at war with each other for centuries, for, for generations. So they said, now they're actually coming together. There's something, there's a common cause that's bringing them together. So we're in trouble. He said, no sooner did I hear that, but I, I got so shocked, I literally started to shake. Because it was what I'd been waiting for, what I'd been searching for for so long. He said, I almost fell out of the tree. He said, I immediately got down from the tree and I said, what'd you say, what'd you say, what'd you say? Tell me more, tell me more. And he said, my owner, he slapped me across the face. He said, mind your own business, slave, get back to work. So he said, I I got quiet, I didn't want him to find out that I knew anything. I waited until I gathered, scrounged up some, some dates or some gifts, some fruits, some food that I could offer. And he said that my last teacher... The monk that I studied with last told me three signs of this prophet. Number one, that he will always accept gifts. And he will take from gifts. Number two, he will not take anything personally, he will never take any charity. Meaning he will give it to others, but he himself will not consume, will not utilize for his own benefit any charity. And number three, he will have to seal the mark of prophethood between his shoulder blades. 
So he said, I go out to the place of Quba to the Prophet ﷺ, and I took some a basket of fruits or some gifts and I presented it and I said that this is charity. So he said the Prophet ﷺ took it from me and then he called the poor sahaba and he gave it to them and he said, I kind of stood, sat at a distance, I stood at a distance and watched. He did not take a single thing himself, he just took the basket and handed it over to the poor sahaba and he said, go, here, go, this is for you guys. So I said, okay, that's number one. He said, it took me actually a few weeks because I was a slave, I didn't have any money to myself, I would have to scrounge up a little bit of stuff from here and there out of my own personal allowances. So he said, it took a few weeks but I scrounged up another little basket together. And I go back to the Prophet ﷺ, by now he was in the city of Medina. And I went to him and I said, I brought some charity to you, but I noticed you didn't take anything from it, so this is a gift to you. This is a gift to you. So he said, I saw that the Prophet ﷺ took a little bit for himself, a bite or two, or a date or two he took for himself, and the rest of it he passed out to everybody else to share with them. That was number two. And he said, after I saw him do that, I went and I sat around behind him. And now my whole objective was, I gotta see his back. Some way, somehow. And he said, you know, you, you know, you've probably had that experience when somebody's kind of waiting for something, no matter how nonchalant or you know, incognito they try to go, you can kind of tell that somebody's kind of lingering around or hanging around, like somebody's being kind of awkward, kind of creepy, kind of shady, somebody's loitering. So he said the Prophet ﷺ of course was a very observant human being. So he said the Prophet ﷺ noticed me that I've just been kind of hanging around, I keep shifting and looking for angles and I'm trying to see his back some way somehow. So he said the Prophet ﷺ realized, so he smiled and the Prophet ﷺ lowered his shirt down. He was actually wearing a shawl that he used to wrap around his upper garment, upper body. He lowered his shawl down a little bit to the point where I could see the seal of prophethood on his back. And we talked about this in one of the earlier sessions when we talked about the Prophet as a child. It was basically the Sahaba described it as a cluster of moles that was in between his shoulder blades in the center of his back. And he said, as soon as I saw it, he said, I ran towards the Prophet ﷺ and I hugged him from behind and I kissed the seal of prophethood on his back and I started to cry. Because I had endured slavery. I had spent decades of my life searching for the truth. And I had finally found it. And I accepted Islam then and there. So he became a sahabi, radiallahu anhu. Now this is where we left off. He says, I remained in slavery because I was a slave. I mean, that, I was kind of dealing with that situation. I was a slave. He said, the battle of Badr came and I had to miss it because I belonged to a Jew. I was a slave. I couldn't go on my own. I couldn't make my own decisions. I was property. The battle of Uhud came and I had to miss it again because I was property. He said, finally after I had missed Badr and I had missed Uhud, and not only had I missed them, and I was very sad at missing them, the Prophet ﷺ had missed me at Badr and Uhud. Because he was very close to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ had a lot of confidence in Salman anhu. So he finally said, he said, Katib ya Salman. Which basically meant that, buy your, buy your freedom. Buy your freedom. Al-Mukataba was basically Al-Kitaba, Al-Mukataba was uh, a procedure through which a slave could per, would approach the owner and try to buy, negotiate his freedom with the owner and the owner would set a price, it would be like a contract between the slave and the owner and once I've paid off this much then I'm free. So he said, Katib ya Salman, come on let's set up some type of a deal with your owner Salman. So he said, okay ya Rasulullah, but he said, oh Messenger of Allah, I don't have anything. Like where am I gonna get money from? He said, don't worry about that, we'll take care of that. Set up a deal. So he said, when I spoke to my owner, he said, fine. The deal is this. You will plant for me 150 date palms. You will plant 150 date palms for me. So he had some empty land that he needed to be cultivated and turned the soil and then, then you know, properly set up the, the whole field and then take 150 seeds or little date plants and plant them in properly to be able to grow and set up a whole garden that would have 150 date palms. That was a major job, it's a major project. So he said, That's, those are my terms. And I want 40 oqiyah. It was a measurement in classical times, like 40 grams of silver, uh, excuse me, gold. And Salman radiallahu anhu, one of the narrations, he says, I tried to negotiate him down to silver, but he said, no, I want gold. 
For I need 40 grams of gold and 150 date palms planted, then you're free to go. So he says, I went back to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and I said, Oh Messenger of Allah, these are his terms. I don't think I can manage. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, made an announcement to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. And he said, Help your brother Salman. Help your brother Salman. And he said, All the Sahainu akhakum. Help your brother. And the Prophet from the very beginning instilled this attitude of, This is your brother. He's Persian. All of y'all are Arabs. He's Persian, so he's an outsider. These are mostly free people. The Ansar are farmers. The Muhajirun are businessmen. He's a slave. But a'inu akhakum. Help your brother. He's one of you. So Salman radiallahu anhu says, فَأَعُونِي فَأَعُونِي بِالنَّخَلِ They started helping me with bringing these date palms, these little trees. So they basically, if they had any date palms or any date trees or small little plants, they kind of dug them out. Like you know, you go to a nursery and you purchase some plants in a pot and you come in home and you put a, the tree into your backyard. So he said they all started digging up their own date palms and date trees and they started bringing them. He said somebody brought 20. Somebody brought 10, somebody brought 5, somebody brought 15, somebody brought 1, somebody brought 2. And he said so much so that they all gathered them together, and excuse me, I'll correct myself. Um, the narration that I'm reading here from in Ibn Ishaq, he says not 150, he said 300. So the narration of Ibn Ishaq that I'm reading from, he actually said that my master, my owner, had the deal was not 150, that was in another narration I had read that was still in my head. The Ibn Ishaq narration actually says that the deal was 300 date palms. So twice that. So he said all the sahaba started bringing whatever they could scrounge up, whatever they could bring, until they had brought me 300 plants. Ready to be planted. But the Prophet ﷺ said, everybody bring whatever you can, help your brother out, hook him up. But don't plant any of them. Then prepare the soil, turn the soil, make sure it's all ready to go, make the little holes, get it all ready to go, but don't plant any of them. Once you've gathered them all together, then call for me. Then come and get me. So he said, we prepared the entire field, the garden, we had 300 plants ready to be put into the soil, and then we called the Messenger of Allah wasallam. we're ready, O Prophet of Allah. And he said, the Prophet wasallam came. And the Prophet ﷺ would go, stand in one row, in one line where they were supposed to be put into the ground, and he said, now bring the plants. And we would come and we would hand one over to him, and with his own hands he would put it into the ground. And then he would move on to the next one and put it in the ground. Then he'd put the next one in the ground, next one in the ground. And he said, this way the Prophet ﷺ with his own blessed hands planted 300 trees for me. And he said that whenever planting trees, he said it was also the reason why the owner made this one of the prices of freedom, was because it was a very, very risky project. Because when you would dig up a tree from one area and try to put it into another place, there was a very good chance that the tree would die. That the plant would die. And so he says that because the Prophet of Allah he says this is one of the reasons why the Prophet said, I'll personally do it for you. Because of the blessing of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And he said, subhanAllah, one of the miracles of the Prophet sallallahu was, not even one plant, not even one tree got messed up or died. All of them were good, all of them flourished, and all of them were healthy. And he said, in this way, all 300 trees were planted and prepared and ready to be handed over to the owner. But he says, finally, I came back to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And I said, oh Messenger of Allah, it's still not done though. I mean, this was a huge major project. The whole community had basically taken part in this project to free Salman. Would you, do you see the sense of community? What if somebody showed up today right now? What if somebody showed up right now and said, I can't pay rent? Oh, brother, uh, uh, let me see who you can talk to. I'll go find somebody, slip out. Oh, just one second, I need to go use the restroom forever. Right? <laughs> Right? I, I know I'm joking, but may Allah forgive us. I mean, this was a community. This was a community. This is what the Prophet ﷺ established. This, these were the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. The whole community, the whole Medina is taking part in arranging for Salman's freedom. 300 trees got to be planted, everybody's taking part. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't say, alright, you go, you go, you go, alright, okay. they'll get it done, don't worry about it. Alright, Bismillah, go, go. Even though that would have been completely justified, right? 
You know, a lot of times, and this is kind of a little bit of a qualm that I have, a little bit of an issue that I take sometimes. We need to be intelligent in our approach in terms of running a community, and even in Islam, we should incorporate beneficial things that we learn from other people and other places. You know, so when they talk about like leadership and organizational philosophy and structure, we should definitely learn from that stuff and implement that stuff within our own projects, even the religious realm. Like Imam should also learn from leaders in corporations and companies. But you know what though? At the same time, it's not a copy-paste job. It's not a copy-paste job. You can never completely copy something from there and implement it directly. You know when we talk about delegating responsibility? Yes, we should delegate authority and responsibility. But it should never become to the point of where I'm now too big, too important to personally engage or indulge in something. That we should never have that attitude. The message, if anybody needed to delegate, it was Muhammad Rasulullah wasallam. The man carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. But yet, because Salman needs to earn his freedom, not only does the Prophet wasallam say, Ainu akhakum, everybody help your brother and everybody pitch in and help out. But the Prophet wasallam says, make sure you come and get me. I need to help out myself. And the Prophet of Allah comes and does physical labor himself to arrange for the freedom of Salman. Radiallahu anhu. So anyways, Salman, the whole community has been doing this project. Everyone's exhausted, everyone's tired. And finally, you can imagine how frustrated Salman anhu must have been. He comes to the Prophet of Allah and he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm still not done. 300 trees. But I gotta give him 40 grams of gold. Like where am I gonna get that from? I'm a slave, O oh, Messenger of Allah. Where am I gonna get 40 grams of gold from? The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Salman radiallahu anhu says that the Prophet sallallahu had just recently, just out of nowhere, like randomly, and of course nothing's random, I say randomly because to the apparent human eye, but everything's divine. So he says just out of the blue, no explanation, no nothing, somebody had brought a gift to the Prophet sallallahu when the gift was unwrapped and opened up, you know what it was? Somebody had found like a gold mine. Ma'danu dhahab. Somebody had found a gold mine, had struck gold, had found a gold mine, and they had ripped out of there, they had chipped out of there a whole big old block of gold. Like just like straight out of the ground. Like a big old rock, a big old block of gold. Solid gold, big old rock, straight out of the ground. And so what that person had done, they basically wrapped it up and brought it to the Prophet ﷺ as a gift. Hadiyah ya Rasulullah. Wahabtu laka ya Rasulullah. This is a gift from me to you, O Messenger of Allah. So it just been brought to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, Salman radiallahu anhu comes, he says, I still got some balance left. He goes, what do you need? He said, 40 grams. He goes, here you go. Take this. Now Salman radiallahu anhu says, he says, O Messenger of Allah, he says, but then... How much more can I afford to be owing everybody? The wording was, how much more can I afford to owe people? What he was basically saying was, a Messenger of Allah, okay fine, I'm gonna pay him this, but then I'm gonna owe you a big old block of gold. Like where am I supposed to get that from? I, ca I can't afford to go further into debt. Like I, I don't know how many people I'm gonna owe. I already owe the whole community what they've done for me these past few days. Who, what else am I gonna owe to somebody? He said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, oh Messenger of Allah, how will I pay you back? He said, don't worry about paying me back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pay me back. And he says he gave it to me. Now Salman radiallahu anhu says, I'm sitting there literally holding a big old lump, like a rock of gold. I don't know how much it is, I don't know what to do with it, I don't know how it's measured, I don't know nothing. He says, I basically just went and handed it over to the guy that I was trying to buy my freedom from, the owner. I handed it to him. He took it and he weighed it. And Salman radiallahu anhu swears by Allah in the narration. He says, Wallahi, it was exactly 40 grams of gold. It, wallahi, it was exactly 40 grams of gold. And the man said, done. He said, we're clear? He said, we're clear. And from that day on, Salman radiallahu anhu was a free man. And he said, the first battle I got to take part in was Al-Khandaq. Al-Khandaq. And now I'm going to jump ahead a little bit of myself, but it's kind of hard to sometimes kind of contain yourself a little, uh, sometimes a little bit. What happened at Al-Khandaq? Not only did he participate in the battle, but he offered 
the suggestion, the recommendation, the strategy for the battle, the dinging of the trench, the khandaq, the trench. It was Salman radiallahu idea. And it was accepted by the Prophet sallallahu And they established it, they, they built the trench, they dug the trench. And what happened while digging the trench? I just got done talking to a brother about it. What did they do after, what, what happened at the digging of the trench? Of course the Prophet ﷺ split everybody up into groups of 10 to dig about 40 meters. Little separate groups of 10, 10, 10, 10. And so they split up these groups and the Prophet ﷺ was splitting up people based on like family and tribe and things like that. Why? Because they were familiar with each other, everybody knew each other. So there's chemistry, cohesiveness. They're, they know each other, they know their strengths, they know their weaknesses. But where does Salman go? So the Prophet says, everybody split each other up according to family and tribe, and you know each other, just split up into groups. So now they're discussing, they're splitting everybody up. Well, the odd man out is, Salman radiallahu anhu. So the muhajirun and the ansar start having an argument with each other. Not the type of argument we would have, you take him, no, you take him. I don't want him, you take him, no, you take him. No, they were having the fight, the muhajirun says, Salman minna al-muhajirun. Salman belongs to us, he's from us. Why? Because he do, he's not originally from here, he migrated here for the sake of the truth, like we did. So he's one of us. He's not originally here. He's not originally from here. This Ansar said, uh, 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 Salman minna al-Ansar, Salman's from us. You got this all mixed up. Because you see, Salman came to Medina before the Prophet ﷺ did. He was here way before Islam came to Medina. And then he accepted Islam in Medina as a resident of Medina. So he's a naturalized Ansari. He's a naturalized Ansari. So he's one of us. And this matter eventually became so serious between the two groups, that, they th- that it got to the level, it got heated enough to where they had to take it to the Prophet ﷺ. Sahaba had a lot of adab and akhlaq. They were taught etiquette with the Prophet They would not take every little dispute like, I want roti, no I want chawal. Let's go to the Prophet <laughs> Right? They, they, it wasn't like that. Like I want rice, I want bread. No, now we're going to go to the Prophet He's going to settle this matter. They, they had some etiquette. Right? So, but this became such a serious fight between the two groups that they had to take it to the Prophet ﷺ. You know, the, so they said two groups standing there, say Salman minna, Salman minna. The Prophet decision, to settle the matter, Salmanu minna, Salmanu minna, the Prophet said, Salman's not with you and he's not with you. Salmanu minna al al Salman belongs to my family. Salman's gonna dig the trench with me and my family. Come on, you're one of us. That was the, the community of the Prophet So anyways, so the, the reason why the story of Salman al-Farsi came up was because we were talking about some of the... V- Incidents and some of the very interesting things, the restlessness around Arabia, amongst the monks, amongst the priests and the rabbis, the restlessness started to increase as the time of the first revelation was approaching, the restlessness continued to increase. Because their prophecies and their books and their scriptures and were starting to foretell more and more that that time is finally coming when the prophet of the last times will finally arrive. And in connection with that, I told you last week in the previous session that there were some, you know, more even like miraculous, supernatural, out of the ordinary events that started to occur. Also telling of the coming of the Prophet, foretelling the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. One of the things that we talked about was because the shayateen, who are the evil jinn, they basically would go and they would steal, you know, they would, they would eavesdrop on the angels and things like that, and they would bring information from there, and that's how they would corrupt the faith and the minds of the people. And the scholars basically, basically explained that one level of protection was added when the Prophet ﷺ was born, and the next level of protection was added when it came very close to the time of the first revelation, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq, another level of protection was added to basically keep those shayateen and those jinn away. And what those shayateen would do is they would work with the kuhan, they would work with the kahina, they would work with the fortune tellers, the soothsayers, and they were in cahoots with them. They would collaborate with them and that's how they would basically confuse people. So they, it talks about that, that this basically started to also, some very interesting, interesting things started to occur at that time. And just generally people started to see certain things starting to occur. Amr bin Murrah al-Juhani. 
Amr ibn Murra al-Juhani, who is a man from the times of Jahiliya, he and he was a very respectable member of his community. He says that I went for the season of Hajj. And remember we talked about this, that even pre-Islamically they used to engage in a ritual of Hajj. Of course it wasn't the proper Hajj, but it was their weird, uh, perverse form of doing Hajj. So they used to go out for something that they called Hajj at the same places and the same season. So he says, I went out with my people for the season of Hajj in the days of Jahiliyyah. He says, I was sleeping at night and we were in Mecca. All of a sudden I woke up and I saw that this light and this nur was shooting up out of the Kaaba until it was finally going and going far off into the mountains in the distance. And he said, I literally became startled when I saw it. And I said, I saw, I heard a voice speaking from that nur. And it was saying, إِنْ قَشَعَتِ wa وَسَطَعَتِ wa وَبُعِثَ خَاتِمُ الْأَنْبِيَا He said that the voice was saying that the darknesses are about to be removed. And that the light is about to illuminate the earth. And that the final seal of the prophets is about to be sent. And he said that I saw this literally happening and it never left me. It, it remained with me and I continued to um, think about this until he says that a few nights later I saw a similar nur shooting up into the sky and it was saying ظهر الإسلام وكسلت الأصنام ووصلت الأرحام and he said that I heard a voice saying that Islam has become apparent and the idols have been broken and the relationships have been rejoined and he said that I went back and I told my people what I had seen but nobody believed me until finally he says that I came across a man in our uh, who lived near us and who was like a monk. He was a worshiper. I came across him and I told him what I had been going around telling everybody and nobody would believe me. And he said that this is a man who will be named Ahmad. That you have seen this, you've heard this. This is a man who will be named Ahmad and he will be sent as a prophet. And he says years later, years later when I finally came to Mecca, and he said this was kind of in the back of my head, and I had never really forgotten about it, but years had passed, so I'd, it, it wasn't so fresh in my memory anymore. And he says, I came to Mecca, and I heard about people talking about a man who had claimed to be a prophet. So he said, I sought out that man, I came to that man, and I sat down with him, and I told him everything that I had remembered, what I had seen and what I had heard and what I had experienced. And the man said to me, Ya Amr ibn Murrah, ana nabiyul mursal ila al-ibadi kafatan, adu'uhum ila al-islam, wa amruhum bi haqn al-dima, wa silat al-arham, wa ibadat Allah, wa rafd al-asnam, wa hajj al-bayt, wa siyami shahri Ramadan. فَمَنْ أَجَابَ فَلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ عَصَى فَلَهُ النَّارِ فَآمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَا عَمْرِ يُؤَمِّنُكَ اللَّهِ مِنْ هَوْلِ جَهَنَّمِ He said, the man said to me, he said, O oh, Amr, I am that same man that you're talking about. I am a prophet of Allah. I have been sent to the people, all of humanity. I call them to Islam. And I order them to respect the sanctity of people's blood. And I, and I tell them to join relationships. I tell them to worship God alone. And I tell them to leave all these idols that they worship. And I tell them to respect the bait, the house of Allah. And I tell them to fast in the month of Ramadan. Based off of this fact, the scholars say that this must have been either later period, or this was maybe during one of the Prophet Wasallam's visit back to Mecca, maybe during Umratul Qada, or even during Fatah Mecca, or even possibly during the Hajjatul Wida. Because the Prophet Wasallam is talking about doing Hajj and fasting in the month of Ramadan, so this must have been happening much, much later on. And then the Prophet Wasallam said, whoever will answer the call, will respond, will accept this call, فَلَهُ jannah for him will be paradise, and whoever will leave it, will disobey it, will disagree with it, for that person will be the fire of hell. And then he finally said, فَآمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَا عَمَرْ He said, Believe in Allah, O Amr. يُؤَمِّنَكَ اللَّهُ مِنْ هَوْلِ جَهَنَّمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from the punishments of the fire of hell. Believe in Allah and Allah will protect you from the punishment of hell. And he says, I said there and there at that spot, أَشَدُوَ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَّكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ آمَنْتُ بِمَا جِئْتَ مِنْ حَلَالٍ وَحَرَامٍ وَإِنْ رَغِمَ ذَلِكَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْأَقْوَامِ And he said that, I said, I believe, uh, I bear witness, I give testimony that there is no one worthy of worship but Allah. And I believe that you are the messenger of God. I have believed in everything that you have been sent with, whether it be about the halal or the haram. 
Even though people might not like the fact that I believe in this or they don't like what you have to offer, I believe in it. He says, ثُمَّ أَنْشَدْتُهُ أَبْيَاتًا قُلْتُهَا حِينَ سَمِعَتُهُ بِهِ وَكَانَ لَنَا صَنَمْ وَكَانَ أَبِي سَادِنًا لَهُ فَقُمْتُ إِلَيْهِ فَكَسَرْتُهُ ثُمَّ لَحِقْتُ بِالنَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم وَأَنَا أَقُولُ He said, then I said certain couplets of poetry. To celebrate the occasion of accepting Islam. And he says, I went back to my people. And our people were very devout, were very attached to their idols. And he said, particularly my father was kind of the person who was given the responsibility of looking after the idols. My father was that guy who used to serve the idols. So he says, I went to those idols and I broke the idols. And I went and I joined company with the Prophet ﷺ. And I was saying, while I was breaking the idols, I was reciting those same couplets of poetry that I had recited when I had first accepted Islam. He said, I was saying, Shahidtu bi anna Allah haqqun wa annani la ali wa annani la ali la ali hatil ahjari awwalu tariki. He says, I have. I, I have believed, I bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the truth, while I am the first one to leave these idols that are made out of stone. وَشَمَّرْتُ عَنْ سَاقِ الْإِزَادِ مُهَاجِرًا إِلَيْكَ أَجُوبُ الْفَقْرَ بَعْدِ الدَّكَادِكِ He says that I am lifting up my clothes in running towards, the, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and answering the call of Believing in Allah, even if it means that I will have to face poverty, even if it means that I will have to go and live in very difficult conditions, but I only want to go and dedicate the rest of my life to Allah. La ashaba khayran nasi nafsan wa walidan, Rasul malik nasi fawqal habaiki. That I want to go and keep company with the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam personally and walidan, meaning I want the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be my mentor. I want the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be like a father to me. I want him to teach me everything that he knows. Why Rasul Malik in Nas? Because he is the messenger of the king of all of humanity. Fokal Habaiki. And I have chosen this path over all the other paths in life. And he says, when I finally arrived to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Marhaban ya Amr ibn, Murra, ya Amr ibn Murra. He said, welcome O Amr. فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِبْعَثْنِي إِلَىٰ قَوْمِي لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْهِمْ بِي He says, O Messenger of Allah, teach me what, what, about my deen and then send me back to my people because I would like to preach and deliver the message that I have gotten from you. I would like to share that and teach that to my people. كَمَا مَنَّ عَلَيَّ بِكَ Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a favor upon me through you. Allah opened and illuminated my life through you. I want to be able to be that means of illuminating and opening the minds and the hearts of my people. فَبَعَثَنِي إِلَيْهِمْ The Prophet ﷺ taught me and sent me back to my people. وَقَالَ عَلَيْكَ بِالْرِفْقِ وَالْقَوْلِ السَّدِيدِ Listen very carefully now. What advice has he given to him about preaching to his people? He says, عَلَيْكَ بِالْرِفْقِ He said, be very soft and gentle. وَالْقَوْلِ sadid And be very straightforward and respectful and, and honest in speaking to your people. وَلَا تَكُنْ فَضًّا وَلَا مُتَكَبِّرًا Don't be harsh with them. Don't be arrogant. Don't talk down to them. وَلَا حَسُودًا Don't be jealous of them. So practice dignity, respect when you preach to your people. فَذَكَرَ أَنَّهُ أَتَى قَوْمَهُ فَدَعَاهُمْ إِلَى مَا دَعَاهُ إِلَيْهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وسلم فَأَسْلَمُوا كُلُّهُمْ إِلَّا رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا مِنْهُمْ He says that he went back and he invited all of his people the way the Prophet ﷺ had told him to and he says that all of his people accepted Islam except for one guy. He doesn't really tell us anything special about that one guy but he just remembers it was one guy because that would kind of stick out to you. You always remember that one guy, right? And that one guy usually, his name is Humble Pie. Alright? So just, just so there's somebody there to kind of, you know, bring you back down to earth. Alright? So you don't drink any of your own Kool-Aid. Right? There's usually one guy that tells you, no, I think you're crazy. Right? Even though obviously he's wrong in saying that, but there's one guy always that tells you, no, I don't think so. Right? So he says there was, except there was one guy. And then he finally says that he took وَأَنَّهُ وَفَدَ بِهِمْ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He gathered them all together and he said, we're going to go all meet the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. And he remembers, he says, فَرَحَّبَ بِهِمْ وَحَيَّاهُمْ The Prophet came out and welcomed them. And he met each and every single one of them individually. He met each and every single one of them individually. So this is another very beautiful story, but 
The, the interesting thing here is, how did Amr bin Murrah first hear the message? How was it first embedded? How, how was the seed first planted? He's lying there and he literally sees a light shooting up into the sky and hears voices talking in the darkness of night. Those are extraordinary events, no doubt about the fact. But there's a, a huge number of such incidents that are narrated and that are mentioned. There's, there's another story about... Um, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu Years later Years later He was sitting And some of, the, some of these narrations say that he was Khalifa He was al Mirul Mu'mineen by this time And a man walked into the masjid And he looked at him And he looked at him a little bit closer And he called him He said, Assalamu alaikum Or he's like, excuse me, can I talk to you? And he asked him And he goes, are you Muslim now? And he said, yes Aslamta? He said, Naam. Ya Amirul Mu'mineen. So he says, Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. And he says, Did you used to be a soothsayer, a fortune teller back in the day? Fil Jahiliya? And the man actually got a little bit offended. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah. Uh, he said, Excuse me. He said, O oh, Amirul Mu'mineen. Ya Amirul Mu'mineen. He says that since I've accepted Islam, nobody's ever brought that up. Nobody's mentioned that. He got a little bit offended. He goes, why would you bring that up? I'm not, I'm not proud of it. I'm ashamed of it. Why would you bring it up? And Umar radiallahu anhu says, La wallahi. He says, no, absolutely. My, my, I swear to God, my intention was not to expose you or not to judge you or not to make you feel bad. I apologize. He goes, I'm asking for a reason. He goes, I remember you. He says, because I remember seeing you back in the jahili days. He says, I was just drunk and walking around and just doing what I used to do. And he says, I came where, you know, they had a little space for worshipping some idols. I came and I just kind of laid down there, kind of sleeping out, you know, my, 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 I was just drunk and passed out basically. So I got drunk, I came there and I passed out. And he said, I, I had just woken up. I had this hangover, I had a huge terrible headache. And I was just kind of laying there in the corner and I saw some of you congregating near the idol. And you had brought a, a goat to sacrifice to the idol. And you sacrificed the goat to the idol and you were doing your whole procedure where they, where they would take the blood and they would stain the idol with the blood. And then they would rip it open and then they would take some of the innards, like the intestines and some of those things and they would, you know, the heart and whatnot and some of the internal organs and they would dedicate them to the idol and they would put them there at the feet of the idol and it was this whole ritual and you were doing your whole ritual. And you had sacrificed, you had cut this animal and you literally split it open. It was dead, it was long dead. You had split the animal open. You were about to take its innards out. When a voice started coming from inside of that dead goat that you had just killed and cut open. The dead goat started to talk. And he says, I, I didn't, you know, it, it was unbelievable. It was, it was terrifying. And the dead goat started to talk. And the dead goat started to say, you have to allow me to kind of find this here. He said the dead goat started to say, and, and the, the, the man, the, the soothsayer that Umar radiallahu was talking to belonged to a people named um, Banu Dhuraih. So he said, Ya Bani Dhuraih. And then he said, Rajulun, he goes, Saha, sa, saha Sahihun. And one other narration, he says, Saha Sahihun. And then he says, Rajulun Fasihun. Qawlun Balihun. La ilaha illallah. He said that the dead goat started to say that, O oh people of Zurayh, that the man has made a call. And these were figures of speech, these were expressions which basically meant that something serious has happened. Something serious has happened. And then he says that a new word has come. An eloquent man has spoken, and a new word has come. And what is that new word? And he says that the, the goat started to say, this dead animal started to say, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. And he says, I saw that and I heard that and I was like, oh my God. And so, so I just went back to sleep. Right? Like this must be a terrible nightmare. And so I just rolled over, pretended like I didn't see anything. And so then Umar radiallahu anhu asked the man, he goes, that's why I ask you. Do you remember that? 
And the man said, Umar, I remember that. I remember that like it was yesterday. It was the most... Like... It was the most unbelievable thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life. And he said, I lived with that memory until the day finally came that I heard about Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I came to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I accepted Islam. And so these types of incidents, these situations were occurring and were happening. And this is a very powerful reminder. There's other narrations which talk about, you know, some of these soothsayers who used to basically interact with these jinn, these shayateen. That their shayateen basically stopped coming to them. One of them who came and accepted Islam, he came to the Prophet ﷺ. The Sahaba say that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and sat down near the Prophet ﷺ. And we saw him kind of like, um, you know, he approached the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ talked to him a little bit. And then the man came to the close to the Prophet ﷺ and he started whispering into his ear. Until the Prophet ﷺ was very like, like almost like excited and surprised by what the man had just heard. So the man actually asked, the Prophet ﷺ asked the man and he goes, tell everybody what you just told me. Tell everybody what you just told me. And the Prophet ﷺ gathered us all to get around. And the man started telling us that I am a soothsayer, I'm a fortune teller. And the way we do business is that we deal with these shayateen and we deal with these jinn. And they come to us and they give us little bits and pieces of information. And they tell us things. And that's how we go when we corrupt the faith of the people. And he said, until so much so that I've been waiting for this shaitan, this jinn to basically come and tell me something. And he came to me yesterday and he told me, and he actually recites uh, a few couplets of poetry, very eloquently, very beautifully. He recites some poetry. Excuse me, I'm going to try to find this here. It's one of those days. All right. Of course, this is all being recorded, which makes it even better. All right? Just call this humble pie. There's no way I got this stuff memorized. All right? All right. He says, "Alam tara al jinna wa iblasaha wa yasaha min baad inkasiha wa luhuqha bil qalasi wa ahlasiha." He says that have you seen the jinn and how hopeless the jinn have become, and how? how they've completely lost hope in trying to get some information and continue this business. They've, everything's been turned literally upside down. Their whole world has been flipped upside down. And he said that they've literally gone and now they've, people are abandoning them and people are abandoning all these practices and the jinn have become completely hopeless and have lost hope in continuing this line of business. And he's like, what are you talking about? And then he says that the jinn basically told him that the time has completely gone. The times are changing, the tides are changing, something is happening, and we can no longer get the information that we used to get. All of these amazing, miraculous things started to happen. The world was literally turning upside down. These things were starting to happen. Now, this was all of course, these extraordinary events were happening because the approach of the Prophet ﷺ was coming nearer and closer. The doors of divine revelation were about to be opened after 600 years. So the world was starting to change. The world was about to become a different place. But at the same time, there's a very deep profound wisdom in this as well. That when people sometimes, and even till today, sometimes people are guided in ways, people are given the message in a way that is extraordinary. No human being is responsible for it. But there's only one explanation for it. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly guiding them without people. See, when we give da'wah and we share the message with people, it's still Allah who guides the people. No doubt about the fact that it is Allah who guides the people. But the people are the means, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes guides people without means. And that's to remind us that we don't do anything. We are just cogs in the machine. And we need to remember our role, that we are just a means to an end. Yes, we value the work, we thank Allah for giving us the opportunity, but we never become overconfident, and we never dare ever try to take any credit for it. I'll share a really, it's not personal to me, but somewhat indirectly is, a very close friend of mine. And he accepted Islam when we were in middle school together. His story of accepting Islam, it, it's almost like, it, it's, it's something that like, 
you can never forget. And now anytime when I'm engaging in any type of da'wah effort or activity, sharing Islam with anybody at any level, it's something that I remember. That I try to remind myself to stay honest, sincere, and humble as possible. He tells his own personal he told us his own personal story how it happened. He basically said when he was about 14 years old, he saw a dream. In his dream, now he knows he saw somebody performing salah. Where that happened, maybe he saw it somewhere on the news or he saw it in a video or somewhere, but somehow he got lodged in his subconscious and he saw it in a dream, in a very vivid dream, a dream that he couldn't forget. But of course, to a 14 year old raised in a non Muslim family in a Christian home, and this is quite a few years ago, by the way, this is like about 19 years ago. Now you know exactly how old I am. All right? So this is 19 years ago. So this is before the internets. All right? So you couldn't just look anything up. So back then you see a crazy dream and he thinks, okay, I just seen something kind of weird. I saw somebody doing something kind of weird in my dream. Until he, he, went to, uh, he went to school and they were having the world, history, world, religions, classes and that. And they had the, por- the, the portion about Islam, the chapter on Islam. So what the teacher decided to do was the teacher, he actually used to go to a private Christian Baptist school. And the teacher basically just brought a video from the library about Islam and just plugged it into the VCR. Yes, we used to have VCRs back then. He plugged it into the VCR and he pressed play and just told everybody just watch the little documentary, watch the video. And he said in the video they were talking about the five pillars. And so when they got to the second pillar about salah and prayer and they showed a man praying, he said, I flipped out in class. I was like, oh my God. He said, I jumped up. I was like, what's he doing? What's he doing? What's that? What's that? What's going on? Because he said, that was what I had seen in my dream about six months ago. And so he said, I completely flipped out. And he said, my teacher got really upset, said I was disrupting the class. Because I want him to rewind it and go back. And what is that? I need to know more about that. Sent me to the office. The, the principal sent me home for the day. So he says, when I got home, I needed to know what that was. So he said, I told my mom I need to go to the library. So she took me to the library. And he said, I went to the video section. I found a video about Islam. I brought it home. I watched it. And it, I was like, okay, so this is about Islam. What I have seen is about Islam. So he goes, now I gotta find Islam. How do you find Islam? So he says, I opened up the the phone book, the white pages. All the kids are thinking, what is the yellow pages? What is that? Oh, yellowpages.com. No, it was actually a physical book back in the day. Alright? So he says, I opened up the phone book and I'm looking Islam, Muslim, Islam, Muslim. And I found the nearest masjid because it was the Islamic Association. So I found it listed. And, I, and subhanAllah, I found out that it was about a mile from where I lived. So I jumped on my bike and I rode my bike to the Islamic Center. And I still remember the day I was actually in the parking lot. We were playing basketball outside. Me and another friend of mine. And we saw this random, pardon the expression, we just talked about community. But we, just, we saw this random white kid riding his bicycle into the parking lot. We were like, what does he want? <laughs> right? What does he want? Right? Does he want to play ball? Like what's going on here? And he said he rode his bike up to us and we're like, yo, what's up? What's going on? And he's like, I need to know about Islam. And we're like, for real? And he said, yeah. So he's like, okay. So there's his older brother in the community uh, that was like an older brother to all of us. We We all used to learn from and talk to about stuff. So we called him and he came and talked to him, filled him in on everything. He was a good da'i, mashallah. Got him right there ready to accept Islam and then we took him inside and the Imam gave him, you know, the Shahada and he became Muslim and Alhamdulillah friends still today. But the, the, the thing that stick, always reminds me of these incidents, I don't have trouble in believing in these incidents. I have no trouble accepting these incidents, these stories. You know why? Because it's a reminder of the fact that Allah guides. Allah guides. This boy, this boy saw a dream. Saw somebody praying in his dream. Who's responsible for that? Not me, not you. Not our fa- pamphlet, not our booklet, not our website. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly guiding someone. And Allah is the one who guides everyone. But occasionally, from time to time, Allah provides. And that's why when, whenever somebody used to bring a story like this to the Prophet ﷺ, like, O oh, Messenger of Allah, the idols just spoke to me. I was worshipping my idol and they said, get out of here, go accept Islam. And when they would come to the Prophet ﷺ and tell him that, 
he used to get, he, he, they say, the Sahaba say, the Prophet used to smile. He used to get very excited. And he used to make us sometimes even sit on the mimbar. And he would gather everybody together and he would say, tell them what, you just, what just happened. To remind all of us of the fact that it's Allah who guides. So these are some very interesting incidents and things that began to occur closer and closer to uh, the Prophet of Allah Wasallam's the beginning of divine revelation. Before it's starting, these things really started to happen and um, these things, they started to occur more and more frequently as again a foretelling of that sign and that reminder that the time of the Prophet ﷺ has come very very close and that divine revelation is about to begin and inshallah in the future uh, the coming sessions we'll talk more about the beginning of revelation may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallah wa bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nasakhfiruka wa natubu ilayk